Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session titled Fertile Ground Advances in Agribusiness. We are really excited to have this conversation today, particularly because of the guests who we get to be speaking with. And just before we get started for some context, I think that, um, you know, very often in philanthropy circles, there are various conversations about agriculture and how it relates to everything from nutritional security to economic growth. But a lot of those conversations stop short of, of where some of the greatest value lies. There are a lot of conversations focused on productivity, on harvest, but so much happens after harvest. And um, this group is really interested in discussing how to increase the agro-industrial value that is added along the entire agribusiness value chain in agriculture. So clearly lots for us to talk about. Um, and we're really glad to have our four guests today as panelists. I will give a brief introduction of each of them, but I'll, I'll go ahead after that and let them describe kind of what brings them to this work. Uh, starting with Madelon Pfeiffer, who is the regional manager Africa at Rabo Foundation, where she particularly works uh, on a project of Rabobank and MasterCard to digitize services for smallholder farmers in East Africa. We also have Fahad Awad, who is co-founder of YYTZ Agro Processing, where they have built an inclusive cashew nut value chain by working with rural cashew farmers and women processing groups. We also have on the call George Sarpong, who is the founder and CEO of Green Gold Farms, where um, George has really used his background in land economy to help companies navigate the process of securing land rights for commercial purposes in Ghana. And last but certainly not least, we have Beatrice Gakuba, who is the executive director of the African Women Agribusiness Network Africa. So welcome to all of you. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so maybe starting with uh, Beatrice, would you mind giving us a kind of brief introduction of uh, what your interest is in agribusiness, how you came to this work, um, and maybe something that you think is a, an under-discussed topic in this area? Um, uh, thank you, Cher, and uh, good uh, evening, everyone, and all the panelists and the attendees. Um, and thank you for the Segal Family uh, Foundation to give us this opportunity to definitely um, maybe uh, share uh, what we are doing in agriculture. And uh, when you talk about Africa and you talk about economic growth, we obviously put uh, agriculture um, as one of the sector that creates employment and, uh, and also uh, that um, have more than uh, half of the population of the continent involved in. We know that 80% of the activity of agriculture take place in the rural area, and the majority are women and youth. So this is what really uh, is important for us at Tawana Africa. We bring the centrality of the women, equity and equality, and the agriculture sector itself at the center of the, the debate of what's going on, especially after COVID, we see a very increasing interest in agriculture and you cannot talk about agriculture on the continent without talking about women and youth. And that's what at One Africa, we intentionally focus on women and, and youth because agriculture is illiterate. And, and so it's very important to have networks because networks are enablers, they are the link between policy and implementation. I think I'll stop there for now. Only for now. Thank you, Beatrice. Yeah. Uh, uh, maybe we'll turn it over to George. George, if you could also share a little bit about your background and, and the passion that you wanna touch on during this session. Oh, I think you're on mute, sorry. Thank you, Cher, and good afternoon to the members on the panel. And thank you to the Segal Family Foundation and the BMW Foundation. I'm happy for this opportunity to tell my story. So yes, I came from a background of um, farming. My father was a priest and we supported the family with uh, farming 
activities because we have such a large family. And so going to university, studying land economy, and coming back working in the telecom uh, space, I traveled the length and breadth of Ghana, and I saw the amount of land that was available, but doing nothing. I also saw the level of poverty that existed, and which was different from Accra, where I sit, and which was never being reported, and how people struggle for food. So this had always you know, been on my mind to do something about it. And when I went into retail managing the malls in Accra, then I saw the struggle that uh, multinational companies go through to procure food into Ghana and sell so in the Ghanaian market. And that, at that point, it came to the conclusion that it made no sense. Somebody needed to get into agriculture. So with my background in land, I quickly formed a team. We went into research and we came up with an approach that has now given us a lot of land available for farming. And it gives me joy to see that we have employed a lot of women in our farms and we pay them 50% above market value because we see agriculture as the only field that gives Africa the opportunity to compete fairly with the rest of the world. And the next frontier, the next big thing in this world is scaling up commercial agriculture so that Africa can become food secure. Thank you. Beautifully put, George, thank you. Excited to, to dig into that a little bit more. Maybe next we'll ask Fahad to share more about his work and background. Yeah, hi, Cher, thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you to the Siegel Family Foundation and BMW Foundation for organizing this event. I think it's very fitting that this is a discussion about the future of agribusiness. Uh, so my name is Fahad. I'm a young entrepreneur based in Tanzania. And I moved back to Tanzania in 2012, uh, looking for something to add value to. I was very cognizant of the fact that Africa produces a lot of commodities um, and agri products, but very little value addition is actually done on the continent. Um, and in the case of Tanzania, we are the third largest producer of cashew nuts in the world but 90% of what is produced here is shipped out in the shell to India and to Vietnam for processing and then re-exported again to North America and to Europe. And when I learned that, uh, it was very clear to me that there had to be a better way of doing this um, and that there had to be an opportunity to, to add value locally. And so we set about um, looking how to build a more sustainable and inclusive value chain so working directly with farmers, uh, women's groups, helping them participate in the value addition, uh, paying them better prices, and then ultimately uh, doing all the processing, so roasting, flavoring, packaging directly in Tanzania, and then exporting a finished product, which just allows more value to remain in the country and for more employment and distribution, equitable distribution of that value along the value chain. Great. Thank you, Fahad. Excited to talk more about that. Um, Madalam, maybe if you could share with us more about your work at Rabobank. Yes, thank you. And thank you, uh, BMW and Seagal Foundation, for uh, inviting me. It's uh, great uh, to be here. And I must say that uh, the story of Fahad uh, really uh, touched me, because that's also one of the reasons why I uh, started working uh, on the African continent. Uh, my first assignment in Africa was uh, a benchmark session uh, with MFIs, and I was really uh, thrilled by the African continent, but also um, I was excited about uh, the opportunities in food and agri. And of course, I'm very happy that I work for Rabobank because Rabobank is a Dutch uh, food and agri bank. And um, also abroad, uh, abroad, Rabobank invests in food and agri activities. Uh, Rabo Foundation um, is the non-profit arm of Rabobank and uh, we provide uh, finance, uh, knowledge, um, innovation and access to markets to smallholder farmers. We do that by uh, providing funding to SMEs, fintechs and uh, cooperatives. And what I really like about uh, Fahad's story, but also uh, Beatrice's story, is that indeed, 
um, the propositions where we can create um, uh, value addition locally, that is really something that's appealing me because it's really sorry that, for instance, if you look at Uganda, that they uh, only um, um, source the coffee, they sell it um, abroad, and then um, the roasters will gain the profits. And I think that can really change because if you really create a local value addition, then you can uh, create um, value for uh, your community, for your family. And uh, yeah, I'm thrilled about that uh, to support that. Um, furthermore, I also um, work indeed for um, Rabobank and Mastercard for developing a digital platform because um, we have noticed that uh, providing funding to, um, to African SMEs and um, cooperatives can be quite expensive because operational costs are quite high. And we really believe that digitalization uh, can play an important role in that to be more efficient and to reach out uh, to the smallholder farmers. Thank you. Great, thank you. So for our audience, I'm sure you can see that between these four people, we have a lot of ground covered and a lot of insight to share. So we'll definitely jump right into that. Um, maybe starting with, I think that uh, George and Fahad, each of you has spoken or is passionate about some related challenges when it comes to um, very frustrating absurdities is maybe what we can call them when it comes to agribusiness on the continent where um, not only are uh, our crops being shipped elsewhere to be processed for, for then fetching a value added price, but often there is this huge challenge of food imports into the continent of, pro of products that theoretically could have just stayed on the continent. I know that in Tanzania, for example, it's a uh, you know, frustratingly common business practice to import wheat from Australia rather than to purchase it from Tanzanian farmers. I know that both of you have kind of different angles on this topic. Maybe um, Fahad, do you want to start us off on, on kind of talking about what the obstacles are to a more um, streamlined system and one that could bring more value to Africans? Yeah, thanks, Cher. Uh, I think you you really put it well that it's uh, two sides of, of the same coin where we're importing uh, a lot of food products, but also at the same time exporting very low value products. Um, and I think that the, the opportunity exists in rethinking these value chains. Um, and we're seeing that in more developed markets, there is a very, very big uh, push towards sustainability, um, towards more equitable uh, value chains, towards uh, fair pricing for farmers. And consumers are becoming more conscious about where their food comes from, how it's produced, and the people that are involved in that supply chain. Uh, and then also having partners like Rabo Foundation who also see the world the same way, because I think that uh, with all three, you can make it happen. Um, there are numerous, I think, challenges in terms of uh, setting up these type of businesses on the continent because it does become quite novel. Um, and I think that some of the uh, sectors, for example, the financing sector in Tanzania specifically, are yet to see those opportunities. So it makes it challenging for uh, startup agripreneurs to really break through. Uh, in our case, you know, the first funding that we that we ever got in terms of uh, working capital came from Rabo Foundation, um, and we weren't able to really source anything. Uh, locally, um, which is a bit sad. It's a bit disappointing, but hopefully that the more that uh, this, these, these kind of ideas and stories get told and are shown that it's actually possible to produce finished products that are competitive and that are appealing for global consumers uh, uh, that will start kind of rethinking uh, the value chains and, and trying to create more value uh, locally. Great, thank you, Fahad. Um, George, I know that you are really passionate uh, about questions around the, the size of food imports or, or the scale of food imports on the continent. Could you speak a bit more to that? 
Yeah, thank you, Cher. Um, so in Ghana, for example, we are importing over $2.4 billion worth of food annually. These are food that can easily be grown here. Uh, but as you are aware, for economic development to take place, you need population and productivity. Africa has the population, it has the environment to grow this food. What is needed is the productivity and technology is a driver of this productivity. But you know the technology to produce modern food are not found in Africa. They are in the West and we have to import the technologies and it comes at a cost, in cost of price and then also time and then the technical knowledge to install and then use the machines. Now, when we talk of cost at scale, for example, uh, most of Africa's uh, problem when it comes to food production is post-harvest losses. You've seen about 30% of yields going to waste. I have experienced it. I've been a smallholder farmer and I've risen through the ranks to a commercial farmer. And you are seeing that the cost of a combined harvester which can help you harvest your fields in a you know, fast way and a safe manner so that you can get it into your warehouse it's very, very high. You cannot afford it. Even commercial farmers can't afford it on their own. Unfortunately, on the market, you are seeing uh, government borrowing at 25%, which then you know, takes money away from uh, commercial farmers' ability to borrow on the local market. I think we have set the record for being the only startup agricultural company, primary production that raised about $400,000 from Absa Bank, in which we found out that it has never happened. So there is a need for a concerted effort for even our partners in development to, you know, make the efforts to help us get access to the technology by instead of maybe putting cash in the system, rather buying the technology or sending down experts to work with the local team and train them so that we can, you know, grow food at a scale. Because doing it in a small quantities you do not always get the needed results. Most of the staples are not of high value. They are, you know, low value crops and therefore it only makes business sense when they are cultivated in large quantities. And that's what we are trying to drive at, that we can absorb a lot of smallholder farmers into our fold by giving them access to technology, to engineering knowledge and best practices so that they can con concentrate on primary production. Currently, what you are finding out is that a lot of manufacturing companies cannot get the access to the raw material like maize and soya bean they need, and therefore they resort to import. It is not always that people want to import, but that is the only way they can get their hands so that their factories don't shut down. What we want to do is to be good at primary production and then move up the value chain so that when you set up a factory, you are sure that the primary production exists, that the uh, smallholder farmers have partnered commercial and they know, they understand the time management, they understand the principles, they understand the regenerative practices that they have to do to be ensure that the primary production, the raw uh, materials that you need is secure and you can get it into the factory for it to be processed. That way you create an ecosystem whereby the smallholder farmer is taken care of and there is a value addition at the end. So the commercial farmer aggregating from them can also sell at a premium and the money moves around. Other than the old system whereby we keep on, you know, uh, either trying to solve one uh, solution, uh, solve one problem, we create another. You build a factory, you don't have the raw materials. If you have the raw materials, you don't have a factory and you have to sell it cheap. Currently, there is a very high demand for these grains on the local market, and we have secured, you know, contracts in running to several millions of dollars. What is needed is the finance to scale up. And when we as a commercial company has access to these finance, we can now purchase the technology and administer it in our local communities such that the smallholder farmer do not have to worry. We can now begin to give them uh, mechanized services by way of rental basis and at the harvest season we harvest for them and then we do the balancing by netting off their costs against what we have uh, given them and then we purchase what is left and send it into our warehouse that way commercial aggregators can have a quality you know 
uh, pollutant free grains or raw materials to produce and they are short of production because the farmer now sees a what an increase in pricing because there is quality and there's consistency and then we eliminate waste and if we now add the regenerative practices you realize that we create an ecosystem whereby the environment is taken care of the soil health is improved uh, plants uh, retain more nutrients the soil retains more water and we can now expect an increase in yield as a result of that cutting down additional costs to fertilize and stuff like that that way farming becomes profitable and then we look at the numbers that are in farming if we can increase the productivity of each farmer you see a total transformation because in Ghana over 50 percent of our population are engaged in agriculture but they what their contribution to the GDP is, is very, very small. If we increase their uh, productivity, we can have a meaningful contribution from agriculture to the GDP, and this can be replicated across the whole continent. Thank you. Thank you, George. I feel like you've unpacked so much for us, and I really appreciate how you're talking about how considering the whole ecosystem of the agribusiness value chain has a literal impact on the actual ecosystem in agriculture. Um, Madelon, since there's been so much mention of the importance of the role of finance in, in kind of bringing these systems together, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about or speak about how access to finance um, you know, kind of interacts with the challenges of doing agribusiness in Africa. Is it a matter of availability? Is it a matter of financial services being improperly designed? Maybe a combination of both? Uh, curious about your thoughts. Yeah, I think that's a very good uh, question. It's also a question um, I got more eh, because people always ask, okay, is the access to finance uh, the problem for financing SMEs in Africa? I must say that's uh, not uh, always the case because sometimes I really believe there is uh, sufficient uh, money available. But I believe that uh, George pointed out in a very good way that um, sometimes you need to tackle more problems um, for African entrepreneurs. Yeah, so it's indeed uh, sometimes you can have uh, the sourcing as a problem uh, or the equipment is not there or you don't have an off taker. And if you only solve one uh, problem, then you haven't solved the other problems. Like, for instance, if you have the access to finance, but you don't have an off taker or the quality of your produce use is not sufficient, then you still have a problem. So I really believe that we need to look at um, the whole ecosystem yeah, so that um, all the issues are tackled. And sometimes you have innovative uh, business models uh, who are really working on that so that they take care of the access to markets, but also mitigating food losses and um, um, increasing uh, the quality of the produce. And I really believe that we need to have innovative business models. So uh, different from what's now going on, uh, for example, we are working together with um, a company in uh, Kenya and um, they play a role in the avocado value chain. What they are doing is that they uh, provide uh, mobile cooling units to the avocado farmers. The cooling units are harnessed by solar energy, so it's also good for your environmental footprint. And the farmers have a pay-as-you-go uh, concept. So once they have store one um, crate of avocados, then they only pay for uh, one crate. And I think that's a very good model. What does it mean that those avocados are stored in a cooling unit, that the quality is better and that they can remain uh, longer on the shelf? So um, that will increase the value of the avocados. And next to that, they also ensure that there's an access to markets. So then you take into account the whole um, ecosystem. And I really believe um, that's a different way of um, approaching um, the issues in Africa. What I furthermore would like to um, emphasize is that um, if you look at uh, the entrepreneurs in Africa, uh, we really have some uh, good entrepreneurs here on board. But um, I really believe that Africa needs more savvy entrepreneurs. And um, sometimes you see, uh, for instance, in Nairobi, yeah, that you have very high skilled uh, people for the labor market, but then they don't work in the agriculture. 
And I really believe that government should invest in uh, management skills and um, how to run an agribusiness so that there will be more um, African uh, agri entrepreneurs, because then you will increase the quality of the companies. And um, I think in the end, it's better for Africa um, if yeah, governments um, invest in training and um, education. Thank you so much, Madeleine. I think that's actually a perfect segue um, because Beatrice is a, is a much celebrated agripreneur herself and owns one of Rwanda's most successful horticultural businesses in addition to her many years of um, experience in, in kind of various forms of development work. So Beatrice, I would love to invite you to, to hear your thoughts about um, kind of what you think it, it takes to, to create a, a much larger class of African agripreneurs and to view it through this lens of particularly extending it to women and girls. Um, I think that we often encourage people to not think of gender as a separate area of work, but the lens with which we should look at all work. So I would love for um, us to hear your insights as to how to do that. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank my fellow panelists because they really have um, touched upon everything that we've been, you know, we are concerned in the agriculture sector. And um, being in a group and an, an entrepreneur myself, you know, I've, I've, I took a break and went back home and started a flower farm. And uh, it was the first time, it was the first commercial a farm in Rwanda after the genocide and uh, you know apart from coffee and tea and then there was a woman and then there was all the uh, the uh, challenges of being in agriculture and exporting cut roses to Holland at the auction and I'm glad Madeleine is there I of course also was interacting with rubber bank and I think what is um, what was challenging for me is to see that even with the network that I have, with the education that I have, with the background that I have, there was still a stigma about a woman being able to be a successful entrepreneur. And also uh, the challenges, agriculture is already a challenge to do agriculture on the continent and, and, and echo everyone else there because agriculture is illiterate. And on the continent, we rather our parents, and I think Fahad and George, we, we echo that, we rather have our parents have uh, the children who are medical doctors, economists, and lawyers, you know, before they think about an agriculturist or an agri -con. I mean, you know, if you go into agriculture, it's because you have failed, right? So there is a big uh, mindset that we need to change. We need to change that. We need to make, uh, uh, and this is something that, um, when we have a, 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 a role models like what we have and the diaspora coming back home for us to, to change the narrative, I think this is, is going miles. We see more and more people getting involved, but it's not enough. And as I said, a good doctor is illiterate. So when even I like what Madeline said, and of course Fahad and George, to be able even uh, to do finance, I see that at the One Africa, for instance, we have four pillars in financial inclusion and economic inclusion. Even before we even take our women, we have um, 3,000 women in 44 African countries and uh, we, that have, have impacted already 500. They work with 500,000 women. Before even I even introduce somebody to, to, to Medland or to other investors, they have to understand how to navigate the financial sector. We don't have that, especially women and youth live alone, even actually even men, but women and youth, they are marginalized in many things, in access to land, in knowledge in business no laws, and how to contract, how to open a bank account, how to fill an application form. I mean, we have women who have big turnover. I mean, uh, those are who are supplying Fahad and working with George, who don't know how to navigate the financial sector. So as a network, this is what we do. We, pre we prepare them and and train them how to access, you know, investors. And I think I that's think the- I think we might have lost Beatrice's audio. Can everyone hear her? Can yes. you hear me? Oh, okay. I can hear okay. you now. Yeah, so I think this is one of the gaps that I identified and that's why I started to say, okay, 
being challenged myself, I have to go and focus. Of course, in my previous work in the UN, I was you know, in charge of um, economic empowerment, but also I'm a food security and nutrition specialist. So this is really my field. And I'm like, we really have to go to the basic, the fundamentals. So our second pillar is market access. Um, George talked about it and Fahad talked about it. Unless we go back to the basic and train our small, medium enterprises in good agricultural practices, it won't work. So donors, government have to re-engineer their thinking around if they're really serious about promoting agriculture. You know, we lack that. And I think what um, the examples that were given by George and Fahad showed that, and even Madeleine touched it, that showed that there is a lack of knowledge there. So that's what we address in market access. You have to know every market has its own in its own rules. You have to have the quality standard, as the Fahad said, um, we, there's a middle class in Africa now that is very serious about what they eat, the quality of food, the whole value chain and supply chain takes place. As, a, as an enabler, we graduate our small to medium, but we need to train them. All those services available. The Africa free trade area, it's, it's a huge opportunity for us. The continent is 1.5 million you know, market. The playing field is huge and the opportunities are large, but how do we prepare? And agriculture actually is one of the key driver of the, 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 the Africa free trade area. We talk about imports, but how do we transform? How do we get, we, we get the agro industry to be interested in our SMEs if they don't even know what is happening? Right? So there's a lot of training that needs to be really done before we even talk about uh, graduating from, from just being informal to formal, and especially women and, and, youth, and, 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 and youth who are marginalized can even access what is available. I, I continue with the trade, and I said that there's no longer issue of, of, of market because now all our countries have signed the Africa Free Trade Area. 44 countries have done it. It is up open since January 2021, but how do we prepare our agripreneur to enter, to trade? How do we export the products from Kenya to Ivory Coast, to, to Tunisia? How do we sell our coffee and cocoa? You know, how do we transform that? And this is what we need to, to you know, to really focus on that. I mean, Fahad exporting the cashew nuts to, to Vietnam, but you go to the markets in West Africa, even in East Africa, you know, you, you pay 100 grams for $3. It doesn't add up, right? So the market is right here, and how to access that. I think those are the things that we really have to, for those who are listening to us and, and, and those uh, donors and the government, we have to go back to basic. How do we start even training for those, uh, our, our, our small, and medium and uh, um, farmers to produce good quality food. And of course, the whole value chain of uh, food loss, et cetera. And um, agri-tech, George talked about it, I talked about it, we, we, you know, this is an integrated approach that we have to, to, to use on how to respond to the gaps that exist in production and access market. How do you export if you don't even know how to sell on the local market or on the regional market? So these are the things that we really have. And as a network, we, you know, we obviously work with um, uh, entrepreneurs and, um, and um, you know, like George and Fahad. And we also have this uh, thing about the perception of private sector, where governments and other people think private sector are, are there uh, uh, to make money, but they don't understand like entrepreneurs like Fahad, George, myself, we are social entrepreneurs. You know, we're putting in more than we should be putting for other entrepreneurs. It's easy for import, you know, to have all those big boats on the offshores of Africa with rice, right? They have no cost. They're coming in there and doing that. But us, the diaspora coming back, you know, to invest our knowledge, our exposure, our time, our money. We are, you know, it, it's now that they start understanding that. So technology is going to be key. We, we, we run, I give just an example. We, during COVID, we ran um, an impact, a rapid impact assessment on our 3,000 members on how they have coped with COVID because of the lockdown and shutdown in almost all of our countries. And out of that 3,000, 90% 
closed down because they couldn't, you know, lost production, lost everything. And only 4% 4, 4 you know, migrated for, to digital marketing. This is how to show the big gap that was highlighted. It was already there, we knew about it, but it's the COVID and the lockdown that showed how illiterate, how an access, you know, lack of access to digital tools was really a big thing. And out of that 4%, 80% were youth, because we have a program called Our One Africa and the 30. So there is a lot, you know, I'm just echoing what everyone has said by saying that what, what, what networks like us do is just to drive this agenda, to say, let's empower our small scale farmers in every aspect of from, from, you know, from production, to transformation, to storage, to agri-technology. So now it's the internet of everything in agriculture. So, you know, everyone has migrated into it. We have members who have Android phones who only use it for talking in WhatsApp. Yet we can, uh, you know, upload on those under 700. I think there was a study from um, McKenzie that said, you know, half of the population on the continent had Android, you know, had access to phone, to phone. So this is a big tool that we can, you know, download knowledge on it, but we have to train as simple as how to use that Android, uh, you know, Android phone as an office for our women. I mean, youth, they have access, but they don't have access to finance and they have access to knowledge of agriculture. So how do we make agriculture appealing or sexy like they, our young people yeah, like to say it, for the young people, instead of staying in town, after graduating three years, you were still in town looking for a job when your father and your family has a one acre of land up country, it doesn't add up. And I think this is where we have to re-engineer our thinking and 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 push for the a transformation, especially the mindset. And by creating role models like what uh, uh, we are doing for hard George and 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 and. Uh, and so we facilitate now when Madeline comes and say, this is, we want to find this and this. We said, okay, these are the profile. They have done this and this, and it's smooth. Yeah, because the financial sector, the conventional finance, financial sector does not finance agriculture because they find agriculture a high risk. Yet we're producing what the, you know, the food they eat. So there is a whole, you know, this is why the role of, of sessions like this and summit like this is very important to continue pushing and creating awareness that if you, if you want to feed the world, if you want to do this, we've got to empower our small scale farmers and medium and medium agripreneur with knowledge and prepare them on how to really add value and contribute to the economic growth. Because without agriculture, there will be no economic growth on the continent. I think George and Fahad and Madam about. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. That was a heavy dose of truth in many flavors that I think will leave people with a lot to think about. And I really appreciate that you've brought up particularly the demographic challenges in agriculture, which are, I think it should be noted, are not limited to the continent. I believe globally now the average age of a farmer is, is 60, and it means that there is really a, a global food security crisis facing us in terms of the aging population of, of people who farm around the world. And as you've, as you've clearly laid out, it's not just a matter of policy and enabling business environments and logistics, it's also really a cultural issue, right? Of people not seeing themselves in, in these roles or in these businesses because it's been a long time since they've, you know, kind of had enough inspirational stories about why that is a life to aspire to. So I appreciate you really bringing that up. Um, so I, we are beginning to get questions from uh, the audience. And one of them uh, submitted by Forward, um, Forward Msika, is, or sorry, Msiska, is what is the major barrier to agricultural growth in Africa? Is it finances or lack of knowledge? Um, I would venture to say that you all have put forward very many answers <laughs> to this question already and that it's not any, any one thing. Um, yeah, maybe but... I can um, add something to that because um, mm -hmm. yeah, I can understand the question, yeah, access uh, to finance, yeah, but you have indeed um, the access to finance for cooperatives, but you also have the access to finance to individual smallholder farmers. 
And uh, the traditional banks, of course, uh, they always uh, want to see uh, audited accounts, they want to see a track record. And therefore, I really believe um, that it's key that um, farmers can use their data. Data will be the new gold um, in the future. And that can especially be important for smallholder farmers. If smallholder farmers can uh, show data on transaction platforms uh, that they have um, a track record over a couple of years that they have uh, sold their harvest for a good price, that they maybe have used the revenues for inputs. And um, if they all store their data on a platform, and of course the smallholder farmer should be the owner of that data, that data can be very helpful for uh, potential funders because then they don't have audited accounts, but then they, they can see, okay, this farmer has a good track record. He increases each year the revenues, and then maybe we can provide funding uh, to that farmer. And therefore, I would really like to promote um, that um, digit digitalization and uh, data that um, African smallholder farmers focus on that, that indeed that they can deal with an, a mobile phone, but that they also know that they are the owner of the data and that that really can help them in uh, getting funding for buying uh, good quality inputs. Great, thank you for that, Madeline. Um, I was wondering if um, George or Fahad, anything that has come up in uh, what Beatrice has talked about, I know she kind of laid out many pillars, everything from post-harvest loss, as you all had touched on, to um, kind of business environments and financing and agricultural technology. Um, are there any parts of that that you feel uh, deserve more elaboration? Yeah, I think I want to reiterate one thing that has come up one too many in our discussion, our ability to raise funds. We at uh, Green Gold Farm have uh, raised funds from angel investors, from friends, uh, school colleagues, former work colleagues, family, you know, we've done all the scenarios, uh, debt equity or grant. Uh, currently, we are working with GIZ uh, to set up a regenerative uh, center of excellence for conservative agriculture, where we believe that we will train these smallholder farmers on modern methods of uh, regenerative farming so that they can maximize their yield at the same time, protecting the environment and conserving uh, water usage. But one thing that has uh, come you know, quite common is that a lot of DFIs and then uh, PE firms only have ticket sizes of about 5 million uh, USD and above. And, you know, for a startup agricultural company, that can be a challenge. Here you are, you are well set up uh, in your first year. You have the governance procedure in place. You know, you have a solid team. You've delivered on your first contracts and, you, you know, you have the bookkeeping records and everything to show. But, you know, the cost of uh, borrowing because of cost of doing business, uh, these uh, institutions have a set target of, say, five million as a minimum you can come but they are looking at abida and then revenue numbers and you are not there and so there is a need to i think create a space whereby you know early uh, agricultural companies that have set up right and i no money is hard to come by uh, there is you know no free money in this world can we find a way of you know getting the companies that can write you know a check from say 100,000 to 250 or under the 1 million ticket, which will go a long way to help because, you know, agriculture is such capital intensive. You need a lot of capital expenditure in year one. And when you get it right, then you can, you know, scale up quickly and produce numbers that will turn results in your favor. And therefore we want to see more uh, institutions, you know, uh, I'm not saying change their approach, but if they can take a second look at helping agriculture play its main role as a contributor and a driver of you know, economic growth, as Beatrice did say, because without that, if Africa can't feed itself with what we have seen since the pandemic, if Africa doesn't feed itself, this is not only a risk for Africa, but it's for everybody. Uh, you agree on the continent, when COVID started, people on Africa thought that, oh, this is not about us. And still we are grappling with COVID. Now, like which we said, only about 3% have been vaccinated. And, you know, if you take about food and health, 
that's what makes a human being and we need to take it seriously we really need to take it seriously so i know a lot of people think that uh, there is not enough knowledge and there is you know agriculture is, in africa is risky but if you can find the companies that are doing it right with a little bit of financing you can actually uh, bring in experts from uh, other countries who have done it we have an expert farmer in our team that actually advises and checks what we are doing giz is also bringing consultant to help us you know get it right from the beginning i believe that with all these things you can change the narrative we can change the narrative many too often i've heard a lot of people say we've given loans out to smallholder farmers and we the recovery rate has been very very poor i say that partner as a commercial farmer that is operating in the same uh, locality that this commercial farmer actually is the uh, person receiving the funding or the loan and they are buying using it to buy equipment this equipment will be used to farm for the smallholder farmers and they pay it at the back end at the end of the day the commercial farmer aggregates the commodities and then pay out what is due to the farmer and then also start the uh, repayment of the facility to whoever the financial institution is that way we will change the system because like the book, good book said money answereth all things money answereth all things it be knowledge you can bring in an aspect being technology it is money even to motivate people i know it's not always that money motivates people but then it is sad sometimes when you don't you are ready to work the team is gathered and they are waiting on a rented machine which they have paid and the machine will not show and they, they have to go back you know crest falling so i've seen it quite too many times and you know that demotivates the team but if you had just one tractor on there you understand at least the excitement that it brings we are not at the same level with Europe. So most of the time in the Western world, people don't understand our situation. We want to reposition ourselves to be food sufficient. This is a very critical matter which we take it seriously because without that, it affects our dignity as human beings. If you, a child has to go to school and it is worrying about what he will eat and is worrying about tension that is home at home, uh, just to put that on our current educational system, you realize that this person is not going to be productive because they will miss a lot of the lesson. They will be present in classroom, but their mind will be somewhere else. It's about time that we tighten our belt and make sure that Africa indeed feed itself. Now it's no more time for talking and wishing and all. Now it's uh, time for action. The COVID came and the first thing we saw in my country was food prices going up. And even now importing the global supply chain crisis, if you import something, you don't get it on the real timelines. So if we don't have you know, our food uh, security on the continent, very soon a time will come when the West cut down their production because they don't also have uh, people to work because of this pandemic, we, nobody knows when it is going to go over or when there's a next world crisis going to come from. But all things being equal, everybody should have a chance to a decent life. And Africa's chance to a decent life starts with is being food sufficient. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, George. And I think I think it's worth noting the point that you bring up about um, smallholder farmers gaining the reputation of being unreliable or poor recipients of financial services often has to do with the fact that those financial services are not well designed for them or for agriculture and they unfortunately unfairly end up getting a bad name as a result um, but i i see uh, another question in the chat uh, from janet chapman which asks we work with groups of very small farmers in rural areas of tanzania like kigoma kagera and mara Extension officers are often unavailable. Can anyone suggest any good sources of support for such groups, please? I'm guessing maybe either Fahad or, or Beatrice might be a good, have some good answers for this, for extension support. You want to go first? I'll go first. 
Okay, so I think this is a very good question, and and that this is what um, uh, 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 we are talking about. Going back to the fundamentals, I think uh, Fahad and George will agree with me that uh, in in the sixties, uh, from the sixties act, actually up to the nineties, we had a lot of program and supported by donors and government of extension workers, right? And the, now it's rare to find those people, right? And you ask yourself, if, if the private companies are going to support, invest in, 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 in the small and buying from the small scale farmers with no extension services, what is you know, the problem? And I think, as just said, we can say anything we want, but if we don't have those support, is a whole value chain in addressing the agribusiness sector that we really have to go and focus on that and stop talking about, you know, we all have smart uh, solution, we stop, stop smart innovation, but how do we upload those, those solutions to the base of the pyramid, which is the, our, our small scale farmers without agriculture extension workers? That was their role. So the private sector cannot pay for those people. It was the role of the government and the donors. Why did they disappear? I think this is, um, I am happy for that question because it's the question we get everywhere when you go in the field. Where are the extension workers? Where are the, you go to the schools. When I, grew, I was growing up, we had a, a school garden. So now I'm talking about food security and nutrition. We had a school garden to, to repeat what uh, George was saying. You know, we had the school garden. Everyone knew how to grow the vegetables, you know, this and that. That is no longer in the curriculum. Yeah, our system, education system is producing what the market doesn't need, right? So we don't know what happened in the 80s, you know, after the structure adjustment, a lot of things shifted and they start closing and, 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 the, and the reducing stuff in the more critical areas that we don't see. And I, I'm, I'm really, I repeat again, I'm happy for that question because who is going to pay for this extension workers to come back? You know, because we need them. There is no way we can improve agricultural practices without them. You know, it is, you know, George and Fahad and I was, we cannot, no one can go and pay for that. It's not the role of the private sector. So for the donors who are listening to us or those who represent them and the government, we really need to establish that if we want to, you know, to achieve food security because they play a key role. They are the extension. That's why they call them extension worker. They extend the knowledge, they link, they give us feedback to be able to influence policy to change. And that is a big missing link. We have seen this uh, from the, you know, from the 2000 and on, it, it's been our complaint. Where are the extension workers? And I think uh, then Fahad can continue and, and, and tell you how it's affecting the, 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 the value chain and the supply chain, because we, you know, the, talk, talk about quality control. You know, they were playing a big role in, in impacting knowledge and quality control and organization. It was, a, it was a symbol of that time of an integrated person who would go in the field with the small scale farmers and, and um, trans, translate and, 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 and train those in those, uh, the, our small scale farmers in many, many areas. And we need to bring them back. Mm -hmm. So actually, Fahad, I see an even better question for you sitting sitting in the Q and A queue. But but you, this is absolutely for you from someone who is the intended audience. I think of a lot of your feedback and aspiring young agripreneur. Um, Ani Isel Ineza says, as a young person interested in agrotech or business, working in tech or currently working in tech, I'm not sure where to start. I'm based in Canada, but originally from Burundi. Is the best way to get started to get into farming myself on my land or join an existing organization? And how would I best identify my market? Should I target locally, intracontinental, or globally? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think uh, a great way to to look at it is, is to look at where you might have a competitive advantage. So being from uh, Burundi, for example, where uh, they're growing a lot of great coffee and there's a lot of projects around coffee production, 
uh, that's a potential product. Uh, and then depending if you wanted to focus on something that is for the domestic market or that you want something that has export demand. Uh, and I think that as you start answering some of those questions, you'll be able to see how you can also leverage your network uh, being based in Canada at the moment to explore opportunities to, to open up possibly new markets um, for products out of, out of Burundi. Um, and I think I would, I'll, I'll touch a little bit on the, the question around um, extension services in Kigoma. Kigoma is in the uh, western part of, of Tanzania and it's a, a very remote area. Uh, I know that extension services is something that has featured heavily in the budget for the Ministry of Agriculture. It's something that they are uh, really revamping um, and they've seen that it hasn't been effective. There weren't enough resources allocated to extension services. And so uh, the last budget, I think they 10 X the budget for extension services uh, to really try to see how they can improve uh, productivity at farmer level. They've seen that there's always been a very strong focus around pricing um, without uh, a com commensurate look, look at uh, productivity. Um, and for us, in, in, in terms of building value chains, you end up having to play that role yourself uh, because you are invested and you are looking for a quality product. So you do end up providing those extension services to farmers. Uh, it becomes part of your business. Um, a lot of our value chains are broken. So, so it's something that you, you have to do. Um, and it's good to kind of see the government trying to step in and, and create uh, a more robust system for making sure that the knowledge that already exists reaches those farmers to make them more productive, more resilient, and to be able to better access markets. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm sure that advice is appreciated. And I think that given the myriad ways in which uh, you all have highlighted there, you know, are both challenges and opportunities in agribusiness. There's certainly days and days of conversation that could be had on this. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling regretful that we only have an hour to dig into it. But um, for all of you watching, I would really encourage you to reach out to these four experts and, and chat with them more about the questions that they've opened up, the expertise that each of them have, um, especially shouting out to, to all of you young aspiring agricultural entrepreneurs. Uh, I, think, I think something that has resonated across everyone's responses is just the real importance to invigorate interest in agribusiness again. And so if this is something where you have a spark or a spark was created today, then really uh, take the opportunity to follow through with people like this who can offer you a lot of insight and experience on your journey. Thank you. With that, yeah, we'll close. Thank you, George, Beatrice, Fahad. Thank you. Thank you, Shane, for, for the moderating interesting session. Thank you, fellow panelists. Nice. We, I'm sure we stay in touch, all of us, to advance the agenda. Absolutely, until we can see each other in person again. Yes.